Right, th thank you, Jim, for that introduction. Uh, I guess since uh, people may be curious about the, the new Intel CEO, um, his name is uh, Brian Kurzanich. Um, uh, before being CEO, he was Intel's uh, chief operating officer, namely he was responsible for all of our manufacturing and uh, assembly test facilities uh, around the world. So he really comes from the uh, um, wafer fab side of Intel, which I think is great. Um, um, and he's been with Intel, I think, 30 years, and I know him personally, so it, it's a good choice. Uh, we, uh, all of us at Intel were surprised uh, several months ago when uh, uh, Paul Odlini, our, our present CEO, announced that he was retiring, because that was about uh, two years earlier than, than uh, the normal retirement age. Uh, so that, that, that was a bit of a surprise. So then uh, the board of directors uh, launched a, a search. Um, didn't want to do just the normal thing of automatically promoting one of the uh, uh, senior VPs, uh, but they did a, both an internal and an external search, and they decided that uh, uh, the guy they had inside was uh, better than any of the uh, other candidates. Of course, I don't know who the other candidates are. That, that's not been made public, but uh, uh, so we now, now have a, a new uh, CEO. Uh, he'll be taking over from Paul, uh, I think, at the end of May here, when, when Paul you know, completes his retirement. And over dinner last night, I, I teased uh, Rashid uh, Bashir about uh, how it's taking uh, him longer to select a new dean of engineering than it took Intel to select a new CEO. So come on, get, get, get things moving here. <laughs> Too many committees that we have to go through. Too many committees. <laughs> All right, so uh, on, on to my talk. Uh, uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, technology scaling and how it's uh, a little bit different now in what I call the mobility era than in the past. So I think you've all seen this, this graph in one form or another. It shows how Intel and the rest of our industry has continued to scale uh, minimum transistor dimensions. We develop a new generation of logic technology uh, every two years. Each uh, generation uh, scales uh, feature size by about, by about uh, 0.7x. And uh, uh, today, uh, Intel has, uh, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. Intel has 22 nanometer products in uh, volume manufacturing at uh, multiple uh, factories, and uh, we're working hard to uh, finish, the <coughs> finish the development of our 14 nanometer technology. Uh, we expect to start uh, shipping the first 14 nanometer products by around the end of uh, this year. <coughs> oh, and of course, we just to remind ourselves, uh, the, the, the reason why we scale transistors are to achieve uh, three key benefits. Uh, one, to improve performance, uh, next, to reduce uh, power, and also to reduce uh, cost per transistor. So those have all been very important uh, benefits uh, uh, derived from scaling. <coughs> so here's, here's a trend uh, going back uh, to the uh, two micron generation, which was uh, around uh, 1978, 1980, sometime in that time frame. And I'm plotting here two important transistor uh, metrics or parameters, the uh, uh, gate delay, uh, CV over I, and uh, switching energy, uh, CV squared. So uh, during this era, you know, from the, the 2 micron era all the way down to about the uh, 0 0.18, 0 0.13 micron era, we were following uh, what I call, what I think most people call classical uh, transistor scaling, uh, following the general rules that uh, Bob Denard at IBM first uh, described in, in a seminal paper uh, uh, about 20, 25 years ago. Um, so in, in classical scaling, all you do is you take the, the basic MOSFET structure and you scale all of the uh, horizontal and vertical dimensions by about the same uh, scale factor and uh, scale the supply voltage by about that same scale factor. And when you, and when you do that, you get these results. Uh, uh, continual and significant improvements in, in gate delay and in uh, switching energy. So, so this was working uh, quite well for, for uh, several decades. Um, and you look at this trend and you say, okay, great, let's just continue doing that. Uh, but why, why didn't we do that? We, we couldn't continue to scale uh, in a classical sense because uh, although we were achieving significant improvements in gate delay and switching uh, uh, energy or switching power, uh, I think the, the dirty secret is that uh, when you follow classical transistor scaling, you are paying a price in ever higher leakage currents. And all three components of uh, MOSFET leakage were increasing uh, during this uh, time frame, <clears throat> including the uh, leakage through the gate oxide because we were making the gate oxide thinner and thinner, 
uh, junction leakage was increasing because we were increasing the uh, uh, doping concentration in, in the substrate in the channel. And uh, I-off, or subthreshold leakage, was increasing because as we were scaling transistor dimensions, we were scaling uh, operating voltage. And as we scaled operating voltage, we had to scale threshold voltage to have reasonable performance. So by the uh, 0.13 micron, or the 90 nanometer generation, uh, leakage currents had arisen to fairly high levels where they were a significant portion of total chip power. And obviously that, that's not a trend that, that could have been continued. Um, so we're really facing uh, uh, the end of classical scaling and we had to do something different. So what we did is we had to start coming up with some uh, very innovative or even a revolutionary transistor ideas to continue, scale, continue scaling. Uh, innovations that went beyond uh, the, the classical uh, MOSFET scaling uh, uh, methodology. One of the first innovations that uh, we introduced at Intel was uh, uh, a strain silicon technique where we uh, deposited uh, uh, silicon germanium into the source strains and of course silicon germanium has a uh, larger lattice constant than silicon so it imparted a, a, a compressive uh, stress in the channel uh, which increased uh, a hole mobility in the case of PMOS devices. And that strain silicon was a technique thus to improve a transistor performance without having to reduce uh, gate oxide thickness. And again, we were limited in <coughs> scaling gate oxide thickness because of the gate leakage uh, problem. Actually, I'll, I'll pause here for a moment. There are lots of chairs in the front here for those of you who are standing, if you want to come up and sit down, relax. <coughs> So again, the, the, the first uh, innovation we, we employed, a non-classical technique, was strain silicon. We continue to use and improve uh, uh, strain silicon all, on all of our subsequent uh, uh, generations. And then at the, uh, in 2007, on our 45 nanometer technology, we had to come back and address the gate leakage problem with uh, uh, the SiO2 uh, gate dielectric. And we replaced SiO2 with a uh, uh, high K material, uh, hafnium oxide based uh, dielectric, uh, and combine that uh, dielectric change with uh, change the, changing the gate electrode from, uh, from doped polysilicon to uh, special metal uh, gate materials. A um, uh, different metal material for PMOS and a different one for NMOS, each with uh, a work function uh, chosen, uh, optimized uh, to get the right uh, threshold voltage uh, uh, for the uh, NMOS and PMOS devices. <coughs> And so we now continue to use a uh, high K metal gate and, and improve it as we uh, uh, move forward to the, the newer process generations. <clears throat> and then our most uh, recent uh, innovations uh, on our 22 nanometer technology was the introduction of a uh, trigate or FinFET uh, transistors. Uh, so uh, we're now using that uh, for 22 and, and beyond. <clears throat> so with the introduction of those uh, uh, innovative or revolutionary transistor technologies, we were able to reverse the trend in uh, ever higher leakage currents, uh, uh, especially so uh, for gate oxide leakage where we achieved uh, uh, more than an order of magnitude reduction in gate oxide leakage with high K. But with uh, you know, the focus on strain silicon and, and high K metal gate and now uh, trigate or FinFET transistors, we are able to uh, uh, continually uh, reduce these leakage components uh, on uh, newer generations of logic technology. And still continue to improve uh, uh, gate delay and uh, switching energy, uh, but perhaps not at quite as fast a, a pace as we had in the earlier classical scaling uh, era. <clears throat> Another change at Intel is you know, we are developing a broader range of transistor types uh, on each uh, generation of logic technology. Uh, in the past, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, when our primary concern was simply to make ever faster microprocessors running at uh, ever higher operating frequencies, uh, we usually, we typically had only one type of transistor, well, two, of course, an NMOS and a PMOS, but do we, we developed the uh, uh, simply focused on developing the fastest transistors we could make at any generation. 
But now as we've uh, uh, moved forward to these newer generations of technology, we are developing on each generation a broader range of transistors that uh, not only improve speed, um, moving from left to right on, on the horizontal scale, but also uh, providing lower transistor leakage, moving uh, down on the vertical scale. So we actually have a, kind of a continuum of, of capabilities, of transistor capabilities in terms of uh, uh, performance and leakage. Uh, and we're really moving on two vectors, you know, again, the performance and leakage vectors, and not just the performance vector as we had in the past. <clears throat> and why do we do that? Well, because we're now supporting a, a wider range of products uh, from uh, high performance servers and desktop uh, chips all the way down to uh, laptops, ultrabooks, tablets, and uh, low power pocket devices. So uh, maybe another way of, of saying this is that Intel is no longer a one size fits all company, uh, no longer developing just one process technology and one transistor type, uh, uh, providing uh, really a range of transistor types to provide a, a much to support a much wider range of, of products. <coughs> So now let me uh, talk in, in more detail about our uh, latest uh, 22 nanometer technology. Uh, again, this is the, uh, the generation where we introduced uh, uh, what we call Trigate, what other companies call uh, a FinFET transistor. And I show uh, two uh, uh, SAM images here, uh, kind of top-down uh, SAM images uh, from our previous 32 nanometer planar technology on the left uh, to the uh, latest uh, 22 nanometer trigate uh, technology on the right. So looking at the left, these uh, brighter diagonal features, those are the uh, gate electrodes. Um, underneath you can see the <coughs> planar source drain structure. But uh, obviously the way things have changed uh, at the uh, on trigate transistors, we still have the gate electrode moving in this direction, but you can see multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, silicon fins uh, that the gates wrap around to, uh, to form the, the active channel. Um, now you can gang these fins together to form a, a larger transistor with more drive current as, as this example is. So this example happens to have uh, uh, six fins uh, in, in, in parallel, a uh, smaller device down here with just uh, a pair of fins in, in, in parallel. Uh, so you can uh, kind of design a uh, whatever type of transistor, lay out whatever type of transistor you want to end the, the circuit. <clears throat> so here I show the uh, IV curves uh, for both the NMOS and PMOS devices uh, on this uh, 22 nanometer trigate technology. Um, and I'll, I'll point out uh, the, the key benefit that, that's derived uh, from the uh, trigate architecture. Um, uh, the key benefit uh, shown here, both NMOS and PMOS have sub-threshold slopes of around uh, 70 millivolts per decade. Prior to this, uh, the, the, the very best uh, planar uh, MOSFET transistors, uh, both at Intel and, and uh, other companies in the industry, uh, typically had uh, sub-threshold slopes of around uh, 100 millivolts per decade. Um, uh, the other key benefit is the uh, Dibble value, the DIBL, uh, which stands for Drain-Induced Barrier Lowering. It's a uh, Another measure of the uh, short channel uh, uh, control that, that you have on these devices. Uh, on on Trigate, uh, because it's a fully depleted device, because the gate electrode has a much better control over the channel region, uh, you have very good uh, short channel characteristics. Uh, dibble values of around uh, 50 millivolts per volt. Um, uh, and again, it, to compare it to uh, the previous uh, best uh, planar MOSFETs, uh, they typically have uh, dibble values of, uh, <coughs> of over 100 uh, millivolts per volt. So again, uh, uh, Trigate is providing a steeper sub-threshold slope and uh, better short channel control. <coughs> so how do these uh, transistor improvements uh, translate <coughs> to uh, circuit performance or power? Well. The steeper sub-threshold slope uh, benefits uh, circuit design in three ways. Uh, the first obvious way is you have lower leakage current uh, uh, with a steeper sub-threshold slope. But there are two other ways we can take advantage of that uh, steeper sub-threshold slope. Uh, if you have a steeper sub-threshold slope, you can afford to tune your transistors to, uh, for, to have a lower threshold voltage. And if you have a lower threshold voltage, you can either achieve a better performance at low operating voltage or if you want to use just the uh, uh, standard performance, so you can have a, um, 
uh, lower active power, you can operate the chips at, at lower voltage than you would normally. So th this is a, a plot here of transistor <clears throat> gate delay versus operating voltage. And it's all normalized uh, to, to this point on our 32 nanometer technology. And this just shows the normal expected uh, increase or, or degradation in gate delay as you reduce uh, operating voltage. <clears throat> but with our 22 nanometer transistors, uh, we achieve uh, either of these two benefits. Uh, at a operating voltage of 0.7 volts, uh, we're about 37% faster than our previous technology. Uh, or if you have circuits that don't, uh, aren't concerned about achieving higher performance, uh, you can simply operate them at about uh, two tenths of a volt lower voltage than you would normally uh, and achieve the same performance. And, and that uh, 200 millivolt reduction in operating voltage uh, when combined with the capacitance reduction from having a smaller device on 22 nanometers, th those two changes combined uh, results in about a uh, 50% reduction in uh, active power, uh, which is pretty key uh, because, because today, whether you're talking about a high-performance server chip or, or a low-power chip in a cell phone, uh, reducing active power is, is very key uh, because we're all striving to achieve improved uh, power efficiency. <clears throat> Some other benefits of, uh, of the Trigate structure, it's a, it's a fully depleted device. Uh, you need a uh, um, a much lower uh, dopant concentration in the channel to achieve uh, the right uh, threshold voltage and the right short channel effects. Uh, lower dopant concentration means you have uh, less variability, which is uh, important to circuit designers. They want to know that uh, they're designing circuits with the, uh, the threshold voltage all controlled uh, very precisely across the chip and from wafer to wafer. So that, uh, that's another benefit of, of Trigate. Here are some actual uh, cross-sectional uh, TEM images uh, from our 22 nanometer technology. Uh, the image on the left, left is a cross-section through the fin. So you can see the, the silicon fin is, uh, uh, on that generation, is about 34 nanometers tall, and it's about uh, 8 nanometers uh, wide at the, at the middle of that fin. And uh, the image on the right is a cross-section uh, in the uh, other orientation. So it's uh, uh, cutting along the length of the fin. And here you're, you see the uh, gate electrode in the middle. This is again the metal filled gate electrode which is uh, wrapping around the fin uh, which is in the background and, and the two uh, tungsten filled uh, contacts on either side uh, making contact to the uh, sources and drains. <clears throat> and on, on this technology our minimum gate pitch is uh, 90 nanometers. I mentioned before that in the past uh, you may have thought of Intel as a, a one-size-fits-all company You're just developing fast transistors to make high-performance microprocessors, but uh, are the products we make, the markets we serve have gotten much uh, broader, much uh, wider since then. Um, so now we develop uh, what we call a system-on-chip version of each uh, wow. uh, logic technology generation where we offer really a menu of, of features uh, for our circuit designers to choose from. Uh, they can. Uh, choose them based on exactly what type of product uh, that they're trying to make. Um, so for transistors, we offer four types of transistors from high performance all the way down to uh, ultra low power. Uh, we offer some special uh, uh, high voltage uh, I.O. transistors where, where they may be needed. Uh, we offer a range of uh, copper interconnect stacks anywhere from 8 to 11 total layers uh, with uh, different pitches, different minimum pitches at each layer. We offer some uh, precision uh, passive devices, resistors, capacitors, and inductors, <clears throat> and a range of embedded memory, uh, high-density SRAM, high-speed SRAM, and a uh, one-time programmable electrical fuse device. <clears throat> so again, we, we offer this uh, menu of feature options, and each product design team will, will pick what is best for their particular product. Uh, question, yes? Question on, on your previous slide. On the fins, you already have at the top something like six or seven nanometers dimension. Yes. So that is a, on a 12 inch wafer. Yeah, we, we make these eight nanometer diameter fins uh, across a 300 millimeter wafer. Yeah. So the next generation, the next few generations, that's going to be changing the height of the fin is how you're going to get the shorter. Length. Oh, you know, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there will be changes on the next generation. <laughs> And I, I forgot to include it in my slide set, but uh, I have an image where we kind of, uh, a higher magnification image of, of that fin, and you can 
count the atoms across it. You know, so. so yes, another question. What kind of Q do you get on your high Q inductor? Oh, um, uh, we, we have a whole range of, of inductors. Uh, some of them Q values up around 20. So I showed this graph before, but you know, just making the point that on the SOC technology, we offer these uh, uh, four different transistor uh, types or flavors from the high performance all the way down to the ultra low power. And these are some of the actual uh, ion versus uh, I off or ID sat versus I off curves uh, from our 22 nanometer SOC uh, uh, technology. Um, these are all measured at uh, 0.75 volts, uh, NMOS on the left, uh, PMOS on the right, um, showing uh, how the IOF uh, values uh, span more than four orders of magnitude. Uh, uh, so the highest performance logic devices are up here with uh, leakage values, IOF values of around 100 nanoamps per micron. Uh, the lowest leakage devices, uh, the ultra low power devices are down here with uh, leakage values of around uh, 10 picoamps uh, per, per micron. <clears throat> As I mentioned, then we offer a range of uh, copper interconnect stacks. Uh, the the, uh, the initial stack uh, on our CPU chips is uh, nine la layers of metal, um, and you can see cross sections here of the copper wires and, and the vias that, that uh, connect from one layer to the layer below. And uh, right away, you'll, you'll notice uh, the uh, hierarchical uh, arrangement of interconnects that so we use uh, uh, the tightest pitches uh, down at the uh, uh, lower part of the, of the stack, uh, uh, thicker, coarser wires up, up at the top end of the stack. Um, so obviously some, some layers are optimized for good density, uh, other layers are optimized for good uh, uh, low RC uh, performance. Uh, and, and interesting note, the transistors are down here, are these real, real tiny things at the bottom. So actually today I think we spend more money um, making the interconnects on a wafer than we uh, spend on the uh, transistors. <clears throat> and, and of course for the SOC products we offer uh, different interconnect stacks with uh, both a different number of metal layers but also in some cases uh, where more of them are the, the dense uh, you know, uh, the tight pitch layers uh, versus uh, the uh, uh, coarse pitch layers. <clears throat> These are some of the added features on the SOC technology. I mentioned uh, a high voltage transistor, just showing how we use uh, a thicker gate oxide uh, um, on the fin, you know, so they can support a higher operating voltage uh, where, where needed. These are some of the uh, uh, inductors we, we also provide, and we have a very uh, high density uh, uh, metal insulator, metal capacitor uh, here. So there's a hafnium-based dielectric sandwich between uh, to uh, titanium nitride uh, capacitor electrodes. <clears throat> All right, so now how do, how do we pattern these things? So here's, uh, again, uh, the trend I showed earlier, uh, decreasing minimum feature size by about uh, 0.7x uh, per generation, uh, superimposed on a graph that shows the, the trend in the uh, wavelength of light that we use to, uh, to pattern these features. Um, Back in the uh, 1980s, early 1990s, uh, life was simple. We were patterning features that were larger than the wavelength of light used. Uh, you know, we're now patterning features that are much uh, smaller than the uh, wavelength of light. <clears throat> and, and of course, I, I had a, a great education myself here at the University of Illinois. Uh, learned lots of things. Uh, um, but one thing I, I was taught that was maybe not quite right, and I can blame maybe the physics department, I <laughs> seem to recall a physics professor, or maybe it was a TA, telling me, well, you can't pattern features smaller than the wavelength of light. Um, so uh, that, that this uh, later learning has given me maybe uh, uh, a healthy level of skepticism about what is possible and what's uh, impossible. <coughs> So uh, anyway, nonetheless, yeah, we are patterning features uh, much smaller than the wavelength of light. And uh, uh, initially, we did that with techniques such as uh, optical proximity correction, where you add special features on the mask to, to make sure that the uh, uh, pattern on the wafer is what you want, uh, uh, using uh, phase shifting masks, uh, using uh, immersion lithography to provide a higher numerical aperture, and uh, in, in many cases, uh, uh, layout restrictions. Uh, 
What I mean by that is in the past, um, uh, circuit designers could lay out the transistors and the wires any way they wanted. Uh, you know, wide wires, narrow wires, uh, uh, you know, one orientation, uh, rotated orientation, diagonals even. Uh, but as patterning gets to be uh, more difficult, uh, we've had to impose more restrictions on layouts, uh, uh, more uniform grids of how transistors are laid out to make sure that they, they, they can be patterned. <clears throat> And, and now we're, we're patterning uh, 14 nanometer feature sizes, and uh, one of the ways uh, we've gotten down to that level is to use something called a double patterning technique, where you have to uh, uh, send the wafers through the lithography tool uh, twice uh, to uh, build up the pattern that you want that has these uh, uh, 14 nanometer uh, minimum uh, features. <clears throat> And then uh, looking ahead, um, you know, our, our industry has been working for uh, quite some time now on, uh, on uh, the next big uh, wavelength change to reduce wavelength down to uh, the EUV uh, level, uh, about uh, 12 and a half uh, nanometer wavelength. Uh, obviously that, that uh, well, would, would serve us well at these uh, 14 or uh, 10 nanometer uh, generation. Uh, but unfortunately, despite um, uh, many years of effort by, by many uh, uh, companies, uh, EV is still not ready yet. Uh, I think one of the latest uh, challenges is, is we uh, uh, simply can't uh, uh, build a light source with uh, enough output power uh, to have good uh, throughput uh, through the, uh, the manufacturing tool. So yes, we, we are patterning, uh, ma making test patterns with, with EUV. Uh, they, they're nice and small. They provide the resolution improvements that we're looking for. Uh, but a key metric in the lithography world is how many wafers per hour can you process through the tool. Um, uh, typical uh, immersion stepper today can probably do uh, close to 100 wafers per hour. Uh, an EUV stepper can do maybe uh, you know, two wafers an hour. Uh, and when the tool costs, uh, you know, 100 million dollars, you you want. Uh, you want more than 10 wafers an hour out of that tool. Uh, so we still have a lot of work to do to get uh, uh, the manufacturability or the cost effectiveness of EUV uh, to where it needs to be. <clears throat> so, so luckily we, we still have uh, you know, other approaches. Um, I'm pretty impressed uh, with the lithographers uh, at Intel that they keep coming up with uh, tricks and ideas to extend uh, 193 immersion. Uh, and maybe one of the obvious ones is uh, to add more double patterning layers. Um, uh, but it, it, that, that does seem to be a very viable approach, uh, at least down to the 10 nanometer generation and uh, uh, possibly even the uh, 7 nanometer generation. <clears throat> okay, so I've talked about um, some of the innovative things we've done on uh, transistor uh, evolution uh, for the past uh, decade or so. So what, what's next? What, what comes after this? Uh, I did mention that, uh, of course, we've evolved from a, a planar transistor structure to uh, a, a trigate or a FinFET structure, so we're now here. Uh, I think uh, an, an obvious next step or an obvious next option is to uh, further improve the electrostatics uh, of the transistor by going not to this uh, three-sided um, uh, fin structure where you're, you know, the gate is wrapping around and forming conducting channels on, on three sides of the fin, but to eventually go to a gate all-around structure or a nanowire structure where the gate electrode completely encompasses uh, uh, the wire and provides uh, really the very best uh, electrostatics. So that's uh, one option uh, that, that we're uh, exploring. <clears throat> and these are some uh, early device results uh, published by our research group up in Oregon um, showing uh, the uh, IV curves on the left for both NMOS and PMOS. Uh, First thing you notice that the subthreshold slopes are already improved from uh, the uh, 70 millivolts per decade that the trigate device offered uh, down close to uh, you know 60 millivolts per decade at least on, on the PMOS device in this case, <clears throat> and the uh, short channel characteristics, the Dibble values are improved from 50 millivolts per volt down to uh, somewhere somewhere between uh, 10 and 20 millivolts uh, per volt. So uh, these are. Uh, uh, gate all around or <clears throat> nanowire type structures are demonstrating the improved uh, electrostatics that, that you would expect them to provide. 
Um, but then the next question is, okay, if you want to make a, a nanowire, uh, how small can you make or should you make that, that nanowire? So we've done some uh, simulations on uh, different nanowire uh, diameters, you know, from, uh, you know, the 10 uh, nanometer uh, the diameter down to uh, sub 5 nanometers. And uh, uh, what the models and some of our early uh, experimental data are showing us is that the uh, mobility is uh, dropping off rapidly as you go uh, below five nanometers. So we uh, uh, need to understand that, that better and to, uh, uh, if we go this route, to, to select uh, uh, the right uh, nanometer, nanowire diameter. <clears throat> Uh, another area of uh, very active uh, research is uh, to explore different channel materials. Uh, of course, I'll remind you we've already changed uh, the source drains, you know, to uh, silicon germanium source drains. We've already changed the gate uh, dielectric to uh, high K. We've already changed the gate electrode to special metal gate materials. So what's left? Well, let's, let's change the channel. Why, why stay with uh, silicon for the channel material? Um, so these are some of the uh, materials uh, that, that are being explored or uh, have some interesting uh, properties, uh, including uh, uh, germanium, gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, uh, and indium antimidide. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the reason, main reason for exploring different channel materials is to provide uh, improved uh, carrier mobility, both uh, electron and uh, hole mobility. Uh, this is, a, I think, a not nice plot showing uh, the relative uh, electron and hole mass, as shown by the, the, the size of the circle compared to uh, silicon. Uh, but also that the lattice constant uh, and, and, and the band gap. So this kind of uh, illustrates the, the range of interesting options, but uh, obviously a larger lattice constant is going to give us some uh, manufacturing challenges and uh, also obviously a, a small band gap is going to give us some uh, uh, problems with uh, leakage currents. <coughs> Qu question? Yeah. Yes. Um, so does this mean that we're never going beyond 0.6 nanometer technology? And when do we stop? When do we drop that designation? Does, does this mean we'll never go beyond a 0.6 nanometer? Oh, just because of the lattice constant? <laughs> I haven't thought that far ahead. Sorry. But yeah. I mean, do you anticipate there's a theoretical? Well, uh, uh, obviously, when, 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 when I, whenever I'm asked, you know, when is the end of Moore's law, and I, uh, I'm sure nobody will ask that question today. But uh, the the you know uh, clearly once you're down to atomic dimensions, you know the. Uh, um, the way we've done Moore's Law is, is going to come to an end, but something else may replace it. Um, so the nomenclature will probably have to change as well. What's that? The, the, the language that we use, the technology known language. Will probably uh, have to yes, change. yes. And that, e even the, uh, the uh, naming system has evolved and is not quite as meaningful as it, as it was uh, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, when you talked about a uh, you know, quarter micron or half micron technology, it meant something very explicit. It meant uh, the gate length and, and the, uh, the MOSFET. Um, but uh, today, if you, you know, uh, most companies are deviating from that very, uh, very uh, um, uh, simplistic uh, naming system. They, they still use names like 22 nanometers and 14 nanometers, but uh, even I will admit uh, on our 22 nanometer technology, I cannot point to the one feature that is 22 nanometers because uh, some are bigger than 22 and some are smaller than 22. You know? But what is true, at least at Intel, is when we talk about a new generation of technology, such as moving from 32 to 22, uh, it, it does indeed reflect uh, an average 0.7x reduction in feature size, and it does reflect uh, uh, an average of about uh, a doubling of transistor density. Okay. So again, different channel materials is a, an active area of research to enhance mobility. Um, graph on the left uh, shows uh, some of the benefits. It shows at least how, uh, not only how germanium you know, provides a better hole mobility than, than silicon, that, that's nothing new, but uh, uh, also showing how germanium responds uh, much better to, to channel strain or channel stress to uh, uh, further improve uh, hole mobility. Um, so that's pretty attractive. But the uh, ongoing challenge with uh, some of these uh, different channel materials is the uh, need or, or, or the difficulty in, in uh, forming a high quality gate dielectrica on that channel. So that's, uh, again, another area of uh, active research. Of course, we've been looking uh, at, at uh, carbon materials, whether it's carbon nanotubes or, or graphene. 
Um, so, uh, which does hold promise for a very high mobility, uh, very high drive currents. Uh, but I think as uh, many of you probably know, you know we have this challenge uh, uh, both on graphene and on nanotubes of, uh, yeah, you can get great mobility, but uh, um, when you have great mobility, you usually have a pretty small band gap, and, and that can give you leakage problems. So still, uh, at least that uh, challenge with uh, carbon-based materials, finding a, a solution that gives you both uh, high mobility as well as uh, 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 good off-state leakage. Here is a kind of an illustration of, of that challenge uh, for uh, uh, carbon nanotubes. We're plotting here nanotube diameter versus the uh, on current, uh, but I'm also showing that this colored uh, contour uh, plot of, of a leakage current. So unfortunately, the uh, uh, the, the highest uh, on currents also provide the uh, uh, highest off currents. Uh, so there's not uh, presently uh, uh, an acceptable solution uh, for nanotubes or, or uh, even graphene. Another class of device we're looking at is uh, uh, called uh, tunnel FETs. Of course, uh, MOSFETs uh, work uh, by electrically modulating uh, the barrier height uh, between uh, the source and the drain. Uh, tunnel FETs uh, operate by electrically modulating the barrier width uh, between source and drain. So in the on-state, uh, you know, carriers are tunneling through uh, the barrier from, from source to drain. So what, why would we why would we be interested in this device? Well, uh, because it offers uh, uh, the possibility of, of a device with a with subthreshold slopes that are much steeper than 60 millivolts per decade. <coughs> and I already uh, described earlier how the uh, trigate device with a uh, subthreshold slope of around 70 millivolt, millivolts per decade provides some uh, pretty interesting uh, uh, benefits in terms of uh, uh, low voltage performance or uh, lower active power. Well, if we can come up with a, a TFET device that has even lower, uh, steeper subthreshold slopes, so we can uh, further reduce operating voltage, further reduce uh, active power compared to uh, today. <coughs> uh, so again, the benefit is that you know, compared to uh, subthreshold slope on normal CMOS, you can get uh, much steeper with, with a TFET. Uh, but one of the challenges is that uh, to really make a, a reasonably good TFET, you, uh, you have to have a, a heterojunction device. So again, we have to get into uh, some 3-5 uh, materials uh, to make a, a good uh, TFET uh, device. So I've already uh, uh, briefly described uh, a tunnel FET, which is uh, you know, not a MOSFET device uh, any longer. So that's a uh, uh, one device I, I think we could describe as uh, beyond a CMOS. Uh, uh, another example might be a uh, graphene-based uh, PN junction. Um, and, and beyond that, there's a, a much wider range of uh, spin-based devices being uh, explored at, at uh, various universities uh, that uh, may also provide a, a interesting beyond a CMOS options. Um, so I don't have time uh, today to go through all these devices, but uh, again, they're, they're spin-based. Uh, some of the names include uh, spin torque majority gate, uh, spin torque domain wall, spin fets, uh, spin torque triad, spin torque oscillators, all spin logic, uh, spin wave device, and uh, nanomagnetic logic. Um, so all of these devices, uh, you know, look intriguing in that they are, are can be much smaller and denser than, than CMOS. Uh, uh, very likely lower power than CMOS, but as we, you know, as a as an industry, as we explore these different options, we have to have some way to benchmark them to understand uh, what exactly is the uh, performance and power uh, capability of each one of these, and can we, uh, using such a metric, such a benchmark metric, can we down select, can we eliminate some of these devices as being uninteresting? and focus more of our research dollars on the uh, more promising or more interesting devices. <clears throat> so in, uh, in an interesting paper by uh, uh, two Intel authors, uh, we, they, they have uh, put together uh, uh, a circuit benchmarking technique uh, to uh, explore the merits or demerits of uh, some of these uh, beyond CMOS options. Uh, so here they're, they're plotting uh, uh, the energy of a, in this case we're using a very simple circuit, a two input NAND device. And the vertical uh, axis, we're uh, uh, plotting the uh, 
uh, switching energy in femtojoules uh, versus a gate delay on the horizontal scale. And I start by uh, showing uh, two points, uh, a uh, high performance CMOS point and a uh, low power CMOS point. So this is what uh, any new uh, you know, beyond CMOS technology would have to be uh, compared against. <clears throat> so starting off with uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, electronic options, you know, they're not, uh, they're not CMOS, but they're some of the TFET, SpinFET, and graphene uh, uh, PN junction devices. As you can see, uh, initially they uh, uh, have pretty good delay. They, they are faster than uh, low power CMOS. Um, and and uh, the SpinFET and the graphene devices initially appear to be uh, to use more energy than high performance CMOS, so they're, they're not very, thus they're not very interesting. But uh, the TFET devices, uh, they seem to be in a pretty interesting uh, place on this graph. Uh, uh, below, uh, certainly the, the CMOS line, um, uh, not quite as fast as high performance CMOS, but still uh, in a very interesting regime. So uh, initially, we, we think uh, TFET devices uh, have some some promise. <clears throat> but now as I continue and add some of the uh, spin-based devices, uh, uh, the upper right cloud there are, are spin torque, uh, uh, the lower right cloud there is a mixture of, of uh, spin and, and electronic devices, uh, it's called magnetoelectric devices. Uh, as you can see, all of these uh, spin-based devices uh, are initially uh, slower than the low-power CMOS, so uh, not very promising in terms of performance. Um, and only a few of them are, are lower energy than uh, low power CMOS. Um, so uh, initially not as uh, promising as, as we would like. Um, but they have one other advantage. Uh, they're non-volatile. Um, uh, and that, that can be a pretty interesting uh, benefit. So if uh, uh, microprocessors can be designed to take advantage of that non-volatile uh, characteristic, um, uh, there may be some significant uh, uh, performance or power advantages, uh, so we need to give that uh, some more thought. <coughs> now, uh, so th these previous studies—excuse <coughs> me—these previous studies were all done on a very simple two-input NAND circuit, um, but the authors of this paper uh, extended it to a, a more comprehensive uh, 32-bit uh, adder uh, circuit. Um, uh, the, the general conclusions are not much changed. Um, uh, that the uh, uh, spin-based devices are still uh, generally uh, uh, slower than uh, low-power CMOS, uh, not uh, and, and not much lower uh, energy. Uh, whereas uh, the TFET devices uh, are not quite as fast as high-performance CMOS, uh, but they are faster than low-power CMOS, and uh, they are about of order of magnitude uh, uh, lower switching energy. So again, uh, this initial benchmarking effort, uh, this initial screening effort. Uh, uh, suggest TFETs uh, may have uh, uh, more promise, but it does not uh, should not stop us from uh, further benchmarking and for further uh, improving our understanding of some of these other uh, beyond CMOS options. <coughs> okay, looks like I'm just about on time here. It comes to my summary slide. Uh, uh, transistor scaling has evolved in uh, revolutionary ways over the past decade, and will and will continue to do so going forward. Uh, with the increased interest in the mobile computing devices and power efficient computing, uh, uh, the goal of scaling now favors lower power over higher performance. And as we explore a variety of beyond the CMOS devices, uh, the uh, selection criteria should focus on higher density and, and lower power. So uh, that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you for attention. We have time for a few questions, but first I'd like to present Mark with this uh, uh, plaque that we've uh, made for him in appreciation of his willingness to come and participate as one of our keynote speakers. So please, your applause again. So, time for a few questions, a couple of questions. I'm glad you asked questions as we were going along, but maybe a couple more. Uh, Mark, you didn't speak about nanomechanical wiring. What are your thoughts? Ah, on yeah. Actually, that is. That, yeah, good, good question. Uh, there, there is uh, some interest in that. Um, uh, uh, our some some individuals in our research group have been looking at that, not making devices, but doing some of the modeling and simulations. Uh, um, uh, it's problematic, I think, that 
problem is some of these devices, the, the stiction forces are, 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 are pretty difficult at these very tiny dimensions, but I won't, uh, I won't totally preclude it. So I, I could have added that, should have added that as another beyond CMOS option. Way in the back, Rashid. So um, in the nanowire structures that you were showing some results, is there strain induced because of the oxidation? Does that help or hurt? Um, uh, strain should help. Uh, those devices, uh, I don't think we're strained. You know, we'll have to put, piece things together eventually, get things better. But those, those were probably uh, unstrained devices. Yes, so, you know, coming from the circuit and systems area, when I look at these devices, um, I noticed that the device community is presenting what is called an ideal switch. Like we are trying to shoot for an ideal switch, and that is being driven by our need to build you know, standard logic circuits, one moment architectures. Suppose we take that out of the picture and say, you know, give us a functional block that may behave statistically. So the process variation envelopes are expanded significantly. Mm -hmm. If such a relaxed specs were to be provided to a device engineer, what benefits can we get? I mean, can we use that relaxed specs to reduce energy uh, significantly? Or are there other ways of exploiting it? Well, I think clearly the uh, the best way we can exploit that uh, would be to operate at, at uh, lower voltages. Uh, what restricts us mostly on operating at lower voltages, not because things get slower, yes they do, but in some cases that, that's okay, but because uh, uh, random doping fluctuation will, will make uh, some transistors uh, you know, non-functional or, or more susceptible to, to errors. So that's probably the first thing we, we would do, uh, just lower operating voltage. And that would automatically the yes. Yeah. One last question. Uh, you mentioned that Intel has spent more time uh, designing the interconnects right now. Yeah. More than sensors. Yeah. So uh, my question is: uh, Is Intel trying to uh, solve the interconnection structure using metals, or uh, uh, is Intel considering other technology like integrated uh, proton? Yeah. So the question is, uh, what you know, what are we, what means are we exploring to solve the interconnect problem? Uh, you know, we do a lot of uh, evolutionary things, learning how to make interconnect pitch tighter, how to uh, minimize resistance. You know, that's an odd phrase, and minimize resistance increase. But you know, just to tr try to do everything we can to avoid significant increases in, in resistance, uh, uh, lower K dielectric. So those are all kind of evolutionary things. Uh, uh, a more revolutionary idea such as uh, you know, optical interconnects uh, is something that, that we are exploring uh, as a chip-to-chip -chip solution, but I, I don't foresee it being a, an on-chip solution for a very long time. Okay. Out of all the Beyond CMOS devices, which one would you say is the most promising? Intel's perspective. Well, I, I already indicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Down on the lower left. Uh, uh, I, so, so far, by by this, you know, this is a let's call it a very preliminary benchmarking study on on a very early understanding of how these devices work. So a lot of caveats on, on my response, but so far the only one that shows promise is, is the T pad. But you know, let's go stare harder at some of these other options. Um, but these are simulation results. Th these are mostly simulation results based on what experimental data we know about these devices. But I, um, you know, as a as a community, as as an industry, we need to really stare hard at this type of benchmark uh, and and apply it to the different ideas, uh, so we can narrow down this uh, range of, of options and, and focus on the ones that have more promise. Thank our speaker yeah. again, please.